Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss basic earnings per share known as EPS. What is the big idea of earnings per share? Well, it's one of the most widely quoted financial ratio in the real world. So if you watch CNBC, Bloomberg TV, read the Wall Street Journal, follow the Wall Street activities, that's the most quoted ratio. Why? It shows how much income is earned for one individual stock. And when you own stocks, you want to know how much you are earning for that stock. And this is what it shows you. How? Well, let's look at a very simple example to start the concept, to start illustrating the concept. The company generates revenues and they incur expenses. Revenues minus expenses equal to net income. We will assume that this company has only common shareholders. Well, all the income is applicable goes to the common shareholders or belongs applicable means belongs to the common shareholders let's use some numbers 100,000 in revenues minus 40,000 in expense more if, minus 40,000 in expenses will give us net income of 60,000 for the sake of illustration let's assume this company has 120,000 shares outstanding and we're going to compute this later how do we come up with this well theoretically if we take the 60,000 divided by the common shareholders we get each shareholder gets 50 cent per share now this is a theoretical number you earn 50 cent per one individual stock it doesn't mean this is distributed because if you distributed guess what it will be called dividend and that's different the company might not distribute any of it they might distribute all of it they might distribute half that's not our problem we are trying to compute earnings per share let's go ahead and dive a little bit deeper into the idea of earnings before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. Earnings per share. As I mentioned, earnings per share connect the profit of the company to one individual stock. Because as a shareholder, you are interested in how well your stock, your individual stock is doing. Therefore, the benefit of EPS, it shows you from year to year how well your stock is doing. For example, in year one, in year one, let's just show you how why this is important. In year one, your EPS was dollar twenty-five. In year two, your EPS is ninety cent. Well, your EPS went down. Maybe in year two, the company made more money, but also the company issued more stock. I don't know. Regardless, when I look at year one and year two, I have two comparable figures. In year three, my EPS is dollar fifty, or whatever. So I can compare my the profit of the company to my individual stock and that's why it's the most widely used financial ratio and you can compare company to company so you have you could have a large company xyz one of the largest companies and you can have abc company medium or small different or small company it doesn't matter how large their income or how large is the company once you compute eps both numbers because you're comparing one share to one share both both EPSs are comparable. So it allows you to compare across companies. Also, it will allow us to compute a very important number ratio, PE ratio. The PE ratio, which is beyond the scope of this lesson, but just kind of planting the seed, the PE ratio is one of the most important and interesting ratio as far as I'm concerned. I, I, I love to explain it, but not in this session. Also, earnings per share, since we are doing accounting, is a required. Required means a must. It means you have no option to be disclosed, to show it on the face of the financial statement. Whether you put it in the notes or on the face, you have to include it. For continuing operation and discontinued operation, you have to compute earnings per share and show it. Now, we have to understand when we have a company, we could have a simple or complex capital structure. Now, why is that important? Well, up to this point, I've been talking about earnings per share and at the beginning of the lesson I said well we're looking at basic earnings per share well basic earnings per share means only basic we have basic and we have something called dilutive when do we have a dilutive when do we have a basic 
Well, we always have a basic because you always have to compute your basic. The question is, when do you have a dilutive earnings per share? Well, it all depends on your capital structure. In other words, how are you financing your company? So we have to differentiate between those two capital structures, simple and complex. Simple capital structure, this is all what we have to do is compute basic. This happens when you have no dilutive securities. Now, what are dilutive securities? We talked about dilutive securities in prior session, but let's list them and see why they are called dilutive. Well, convertible bond, convertible preferred stock, stock options, stock warrants. What did we learn about all of those? Well, convertible stocks and can be converted into more common stock. Convertible preferred can be converted into more con con common stock. Stock options, if exercised, they will increase your common stock and stock warrant leads to more common stock. Well, why is that relevant for us? Well, it's relevant because when we compute earnings per share, we take net income divided by the number of common shares outstanding. Well, that's fine if we are computing the basic. But if we have dilutive shares, there's the possibility of the denominator going up. Well, if the denominator goes up more than the numerator, what do we know about the, the formula? This number could go down. So if you have a if you have dilutive securities, there is the potential of your earnings per share. Potential means what? It means if the convertible bond convert, if the preferred stock can convert, if the stock option exercise, your earnings per share could be lower. Therefore, if you have a complex capital structure, if you have a complex capital structure, you are required to compute dilutive earnings per share because your shares could be potentially your earnings per share is potentially, potentially means possible. That's why you have to do the computation, take net income over the new shares, because when the denominator happen, the numerator will change as well. We'll see that later. Then you have to see what is the effect. If the effect is down, it's dilutive. What do I mean by dilutive? Well, the simplest example that I can tell you is when when we buy orange juice, for example, at my, at my home, my wife, what she does, she always add water to her orange juice. Why? Because she thinks it's too sugary. She, she wants to dilute it. So when you add water, you reduce the effect of the sugar. You reduce the effect of the sugar and the orange. This is what dilutive is. So when you add more to the denominator, you reduce the effect of earnings per share. It goes down. If it goes down, it's considered dilutive. Sometimes it doesn't go down. Sometimes actually it goes up. We'll talk about dilutive in a separate recording. I just wanted to understand, I want you to understand that we have basic and we have dilutive. In this session, we'll, fo we'll focus on the basic, which is taking net income minus preferred dividend. Now, let's talk about preferred dividend. Remember when I started this, I said net income applicable, applicable to common shareholders, to common stock. Why? Because you might have net income, but if you have preferred Preferred stock, the preferred stock, you will need to pay them first. After you pay them, what's left is net income applicable to common shareholders. Therefore, you will take this number, you divide this by the weighted average number of shares. Now, we have to understand, when do we, do we always deduct preferred dividend? And the answer, if the preferred dividend is cumulative, we always deduct it, whether it's declared or not for that year because we only deduct that particular year what do we mean cumulative well hopefully you know what cumulative is otherwise i'm going to explain it year one year two and year three let's assume you have preferred stock and in year one you did not make any profit you did not pay any dividend therefore the, the preferred shareholders did not get any money in year two same thing the company did not make a profit or did not pay dividend in year three the company made a lot of money and now they are ready to pay dividend if the preferred dividend is cumulative, they have to pay year one, year two, then year three. So, regardless whether they pay or not, if the preferred is cumulative, you assume you are responsible for it. You deduct only one year of dividend, obviously, as I told you, for that particular year. If the if the preferred is non-cumulative, if the prefer if the preferred is non-cumulative, you only deduct if declared. So, if in year one you did not make any profit, no dividend. In year two, you did not make any profit or you did not declare it, no dividend. In year three, you made a lot of money. Guess what? You only pay year three. You don't have to go back and pay year two and year one because the preferred is non-cumulative. Preferred dividend comes in different flavors. 
So some are cumulative, some are none. So be careful when you are looking at the exercise, whether it's a cumulative or not. Now let's talk about the denominator, which is the weighted average number of shares. You must weigh the number of shares by the fraction of the period outstanding. Why? Because during the year, the company might issue new shares, might buy back new shares. Therefore, you have to weigh them. What does that mean? Well, the best way is to look at an example. For example, let's assume this company started the year with 100,000 shares. Great. So this is the beginning of the year. And we have 100K in shares. And that's what they have till March 1st. On March 1st, they issued 30,000 shares. So from January 1st till March 1st, they had 100K. Therefore, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this, I'm going to do, I'm going to take this 100K and prorate it over the fraction of the year that's outstanding, which is 212 of the year. On March 1st, they added 30,000 shares. Now, what did they have on starting March, March 1st? 130,000 shares. And they had this from March till July. So you're going to take, we're going to take all of March, all of April, May, and June. So they had this for four months. So we're going to take this 130 multiplied by 412. Here, what they did is they reduced their shares. They purchased 39,000 shares. Now they have 91,000 shares. And this goes from July till November. July till November, we have 91,000 shares. So we have July, August, September, October, 412. Then they issued 70,000 shares. Then they issued 70,000 shares. That's going to bring them up to 161. And that's from November 1st till end of the year, December. So all of November, all of December, that's time times 212. Notice 2 plus 4, 6 plus 4, 10 plus 212. We accounted for all 12 months. This is how we prorated the shares. So let me show you the, 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 the computation. 100,000 times 212, 130 times 412, 91 times 412, 161 times 412. And those are the weighted average. And the weighted average number of shares outstanding, the weighted average number of shares outstanding, if my math is right, this is rounding, because you know I have 0.333, 0.33, 0.33, 117,165,000, 000, assuming I did the computation right, which I hope. Now let's move to a more complicated scenario. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to include dividend, stock dividend, where the company declared stock dividend throughout the year, and the company declared stock split at the end of the year. So how do we have to compute the weighted average number of shares if we have a stock dividend and stock split? Well, let's see what happened here. We started with 100,000 shares. Let's go back to this timeline here. We started with 100,000 shares. Then we added 30. After we added 30, on May 1st, we multiply this by, we increase the shares by 10%. Then we purchased 39,000 shares, then we issued 70,000, then we did a stock split. So here's what you have to know. Then we'll do the computation. For the 10% dividend, the 10% dividend applies to all the shares as of the beginning of the year because it happens on May 1st. So anything prior to May 1st will, be, will receive a 10% additional dividend. The stock split, whenever a stock split happened, this happens at the end of the year, which is easy. If it happens at the end of the year, not easy, what I'm trying to make, what the point I'm trying to make, it, if it if it applies to all the shares outstanding as of the beginning of the year. So what's going to happen at the end, we're going to go back and double everything. So let's see how we compute this. Well, hopefully you understand that from January 1st till March 1st, we had 100,000 shares times 212. Now 100,000 100, shares, let me get the calculator here and do this in front of you. 100,000, let's do 212 first. 2 divided by 12 is 0.16666 times 100,000. That's 16,666,000 shares. Now, those shares are subject to a, to a what? To a 10% to a increase. So we have 16,666. Now we have to increase it by 10%. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to multiply it by 1.1. 1.1. Why 1.1? I can only multiply it by 0.1, then add the number to 16.666. But I'm going to go ahead and multiply it by 1.1 to do what? To get the number and add the 10%. That's going to give me 18,333. And those shares are also subject to the stock split of 2. 
times two, and that's gonna give me 36,366. I will do the same thing from March till May. From March till May, I had 130,000 shares, all of March, all of April, times 212, that I'm gonna, this amount is subject to a 10% increase and subject to the double. Then, after that, after that, after we added 13,000, we deducted 39,000 shares. So we had 104,000 shares from May till November, which is all of May, June, July, August, September, October, times 612. So we multiplied by 612. Then this amount is subject to the stock split, which is 241, which we double. We'll go back to 104. Notice the 104 are not subject to the 10% stock dividend because the stock dividend took place before then from november 1st till december 31st we had 174,000 shares because we issued an additional 70,000 shares times 212 again this amount is subject to doubling subject to the stock split of 58,000 now if my math is right my weighted average number of shares outstanding is 246,332 so i would say the most challenging here is how to compute weighted average number of shares outstanding when you are computing earnings per share which is the denominator in the numerator you have net income applicable to common shareholders which is net income minus preferred dividend pretty straightforward the denominator is what gives students some problem especially when you have stock split and stock dividend but i showed you how to deal with those rules in order to compute the weighted average number of shares outstanding what should you do now? You should go to Farhat Lectures, whether you are a CPA candidate or an accounting student. The CPA exam is worth it. Invest in yourself. Invest in your career. You are making a 20, 30, 40 year investment in yourself. Don't shortchange yourself. Take it seriously. It's worth it. Good luck and stay safe.